him back in one piece. Um, I thought he was threatening to leave his son there, but I'm glad he didn't do that. Would you stand and testify what you saw happen down in Dominican Republic? Amen. Amen. I wish everybody could experience it. I really honestly do. We, we get too professional in, a, in the United States with our churches and too accustomed to a lot of things. God's blessed us so abundantly. But it's true. When you get over there and you see people that don't have very much according to our standards, but they do have a deep love for God. And uh, it's just so sweet and so refreshing, the joy of the Lord. And to hear him talking in tongues just like we do. I mean, it's just like, hey, that's the same thing we do. <laughs> no different. That's, that's a tremendous, tremendous experience. Amen. Daniel chapter 1. Last week we just did a introduction to the book of Daniel, just an overview of um, the scope of it. And so tonight we're going to do chapter 1. Let me put a caveat to it. Um, if you'll notice on your pages, it's six pages, uh, three pages back to back, so six pages in all. And if I don't make it all the way through tonight, there's next week. And if the Lord comes before next week, we'll have a greater understanding over there than we do over here. That's all I got to say. You'll get a better preacher next week if the, if the rapture takes place. And uh, I want to go. I want to go. I want to make the rapture, saints. I want to see Jesus face to face. So if you'll stand with me, we're going to, um, we're just going to pray. And then we're going to go into this. And we're going to go at a few verses at a time as we make our way through this particular chapter. I, I remind you again, Paul said, pray for us and talking about the ministry. And we do covet your prayers uh, because I never want to try to attempt this in the flesh. I want to do it because the Holy Ghost is imprompting, prompting me and, and uh, anointed by him. So pray, pray that God would touch me, pray that God would touch your ears to hear. In Jesus' name, Lord, we love you. Let that be our baseline. Let that be where everything begins, starts, and finishes. Is God in our deep love for you, love for your word, the respect for the things of God. I pray as we look into this that God, the very core concept that's behind this, that I would be able to communicate it faithfully to these saints. I'm asking that in the name of Jesus. Help me to do that. Help us to hear what the Spirit is saying in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank the Lord. So what we're going to look at, I'm putting a, sub, a, a title to this uh, particular night, and that is keeping pure in the face 
of adversity. And, uh, and you can keep pure in the face of trouble and adversity and people coming against you. You don't have to have perfect scenarios to live for God. You don't have to have that. All you've got to have is a determination that I will live for God. Come what may, I will live for God. And uh, again, I'm going to go back down on the bottom of the screen is the theme of the book that I gave you last week. And we're going to reiterate this over and over the fact that through this entire book, there's a consistent theme that God rules in the kingdoms of men. He's the one that sets people up. He's the one that takes people down. And he is in control of all things. I am so tempted. I'm so tempted to skip through these first six books or six chapters and just go to his dreams and visions of the end time because it is so relevant to where we're at. But. I felt in prayer that God said, there's a reason I started it out with the foundational concepts that I did. Before you get into the visions, before you get into the mysteries of the things of God, you've got to have something settled in the bedrock of your spirit, and that is God is in control. God is in control. And so we're going to examine these things again. And, uh, and took a, uh, take a look at those. So let's start here in Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. says this, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with a part of the vessels of the house of God. So let me say a part of the vessels. He can get everything which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. I'm sitting here thinking it would be so easy, guys, to preach an entire message just on those first two verses. And so the preacher in me has got to trim some things and, uh, and keep it down to that. Some of the beauty of the Word of God is, is not always apparent. You have to study. You have to research and find some things out. One of the things that is very important when you go to reading the Old Testament is you have to have an understanding that the names in the Old Testament, uh, especially among the Hebrews, had great significance. Great significance. And just like some of the Indians uh, back when we first uh, overran the, the land of America. Uh, <laughs> Got to be careful, you know, because I'm part Indian too. Just that part that gets hot-headed some days. But anyway, and so, but, um, you know, they, they may call them whatever significant event in life that took place or name them because of a trait or something like that. Well, the Jews named them intentionally in certain ways. And sometimes when they gave a child a name, it was quite prophetic, or many, many of the names were simply statements of praise to God. And so when you begin to look at the name of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, now Jehoiakim was not necessarily of the lineage and the race of David. Uh, he wasn't necessarily a part of that that was going back there. He was a Jehit Judean king, but he was placed on the throne by Pharaoh. He was not given it because of the direct lineage of things. He was given it because he was a what we refer to as a vassal king. He was a puppet king underneath the control of Pharaoh. And so his name means, and this is the, the um, what, what's the word I'm looking for here? It's the um, joke in it. It's, it's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Not parody, but anyway, is the fact that his name means Yahweh raises up. That's what his name literally means. Yahweh raises up. But he was not put in his position by God. He was put in there by Pharaoh. 
So his whole name is hypocritical when it comes to you looking at his rule and reign upon the throne of, of Israel. So Pharaoh is the one that did that. The second character that comes into play here is Nebuchadnezzar. The name Nebuchadnezzar is actually a Hebrew uh, rendition of his, his um, Babylonian name. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce his Babylonian name. But his Babylonian name literally means Nebo protects the crown. So you have a statement that he is protected by his heathen idol God. So right up front, we have this contrast between these two men. And, uh, and so we have one, a king of Israel, or Judah rather, and then you have, you have this other one who is dependent and depending upon his heathen God for his authority and his place. Now, the Bible said that he came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. Now, by that, we, we kind of get the idea that Babylon just decided, we're going to go down there and we're going to wipe out uh, Jerusalem. And we're going to take Jerusalem. What actually happened was Egypt and the Pharaoh in Egypt battled with Babylon. That's where it all began and started out was because there was this war between Egypt and Babylon. And because Israel during that time was paying tribute and being controlled by Egypt, it was either on the way there or on the way back. Nebuchadnezzar stopped at Jerusalem and besieged it. It was one of the two things. It was not the primary purpose that, uh, that he had. It wasn't the real goal of his conquest. His goal was Egypt. But because of the relationship between the two, he came against this vassal king that was under the control of Pharaoh. And that's how that particular thing took place. And then the scripture is clear about this. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Bear in mind this entire concept that God manages the affairs of men, that God is in control of all of those things. It appears from the outside that the heathen God of the Babylonians was greater than the Israelite God. Okay, But the fact of the matter is, God's not going to let them be taken. He proves that to his people over and over and over again. How they with a minority. What was it with Gideon? 300 men came against 180,000 men, and they ran because of 300 men. God's able, it's not by the number. That it, that matter. It's not how strong of an army that God is using. It's the fact that God is behind the entire thing. And if God is behind it, there's nothing else that can happen. God will stop it. He used a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire to separate Israel from this, their enemies when they were in the wilderness. God can do whatever he chooses to do. But because of the condition of Judah... Hear me, because of what was going on in there, that was why God permitted Jehoiakim to be taken by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we can, we can look in, back into the scripture and we can find in Isaiah, because Isaiah was contemporary and part of this time, it was prophesied by Isaiah in uh, chapter 39 in verse 7. He said this, of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which, shall be, uh, which thou shalt beget. They shall be taken away and shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now this setting took place right after one of the kings of, of I think it was Hezekiah, he, he allowed the people, the emissaries from Babylon to come in and look at the wealth of Israel. He should have never revealed the secrets of Israel, the riches of Israel to a heathen king, his enemy. Should have never done that because it planted seeds in their mind. There's a treasure in Israel if we can go in there and take it. 
Now, this verse was the prophecy by Isaiah as he talked to Hezekiah because of what he did and because of the things that he allowed. One of the most disturbing verses in the Bible to me is the verse after verse 7 because he goes on and says that it was good in his eyes because it wasn't going to happen in his days. It's like, I don't care what happens to Aiden just as long as it doesn't happen to me. Would that be crass or what? That would be bad, but we don't care the destruction that our kids are going to have to face as long as we don't have to go through it. That, 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 just, that goes against everything at the heart of a parent that I understand because I don't want my children to have to face the judgment of God. I'd rather repent, get right with God so that they didn't have to face those things. Somebody say amen. So it was prophesied in chapter 30, uh, seven, uh, 39, verse 7. The Lord gave Judah into the hands of the Babylonians, Babylonians for two reasons. This is why they spent the time. Bear in mind, they didn't go like they did in, into Syria. They didn't go like they did into the, the captivity where they lost the ten tribes. This was a specific time on, as God dealt with his people. But two reasons. Number one was Israel's idolatry. God's a jealous God. God's not going to put up with you playing around spiritually. The Bible refers to it as, as Israel playing the harlot. And, uh, and you remember the time that he took a prophet, uh, Hosea, and he told him to go down to where the prostitutes were at and to marry one of them in that kind of lifestyle. And it's like, why would you ask a godly man to go marry somebody that's such an ungodly woman? And uh, it was a typology that God wanted to show that I love you enough that I'll take you out of where you're at, clean you up, and give you everything you want. But Gomer would not change. She kept going back to her old lovers and back into those things. The entire thing was a visible lesson to Israel. And God was trying to say, I want to take you out from among them. I want to clean you out, put you my love upon you. But the fact is they kept wandering back to things until finally God had to deal with it. The second thing that were the reason that God allowed them to go into captivity was because their failure to observe the Sabbaths for the land. Bear in mind, you remember the six days of creation. He created the, the, all that was, mankind, animals, all those kind of things. And on the seventh day, he rested. That was the first first Sabbath, and then he set forth the principle of the keeping of the Sabbath, that six days you're to work, the seventh day you are to rest. And we understand in the New Testament, the infilling of the Holy Ghost is our, our rest. Somebody shout amen. amen. We know that we don't keep one day holier than the next day, but that doesn't mean you should work seven days a week either. You need to take a day of physical rest and, and give it to God. When I was back in Bible college, <laughs> Clyde Haney taught this so strong that you went to church on Sunday morning and you could not put on a pair of blue jeans Sunday afternoon. He better not catch you in the, in the, in the court playing basketball. He better not play, find you out there playing football because he'd get all over you because of doing something like that. He meant on the day of Sunday you were to rest. And, uh, and so he, he was very, very strong about those things. And, um, and I, I, I understand it because you, you can't, you don't go to church on Sunday morning and wear yourself slap out on Sunday afternoon and give your best to God on Sunday night. You can't do it. So let's just be logical about that. Not like I'm trying to create a doctrine here. But 
But the Sabbath, we understand the concept of the keeping of the Sabbath. We understand the concept that when it came to manna, manna fell six days, and on the sixth day, twice was given, and they didn't have to do it on the seventh day. There was sufficient. God kept it over on the seventh day, and it preserved it. God intended for them. He, he train them in this process that 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 seventh day was holy unto the lord but when they cross over into the into the promised land they're no longer being fed by the morning manna they're no longer being fed by the daily miracle six days a week i feel the holy ghost here hear me now on that when they went into the into the land of promise. From then, he's going to give them land. And they're going to have vineyards they didn't plant, crops that they didn't plant, houses that they didn't build, cities that they didn't build, and all of those things. But you no longer have the daily dependency. You have to do things by principle. You get a harvest, you take care of that harvest and budget that harvest. I'm telling you I could do some preaching out of this verse because I, I want you to understand something. When we were kids, I'll never forget the day that Mama went to Safeway and loaded up. And those buggies back then were ginormous. I decided to use a word that's not real, okay? It was huge. And Mama bought a hundred dollars worth of groceries. I'd even hate to think what that would equate in a in a in a today's market. I, it, it'd probably be like Mama spending four hundred dollars or so on groceries. I don't know. Maybe more than that. I just remember that buggy was chalk. Full. And I also remember her fussing at us a few days later because all those extras she bought were gone in a few days. We're growing teenagers. What do you expect us to do? We ate her out of house and home. But, you know, so many times we take the blessings of God and we do the same thing with it. We scarf it, we go through it, and then when it comes down to the end, we have nothing. When you live under the, the concept of the, the, the principles of, of no longer being in the wilderness, but you're in the promised land, the land that floats with milk and honey, it's, it's a land that has got responsibility. God gives you blessings in advance. And you've got to take care of the blessings of God. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Hear me, saints of God. God wants to put you in a place where he can trust you with a blessing, not just give you a blessing. He wants to trust you with a blessing where you use it in a wise way. And when you do that, you, you set it aside. And God said, now, I want to show you another principle, not only the Sabbath of the week, but I want you every seven years, I want you to let the land rest. You go do some other job on the seventh year. You work some other occupation on the seventh year. You rebuild the barns and do whatever you want to on the seventh year. But on the seventh year, don't plow the fields. Let them sit fallow. I can't do that. i got to feed my family. Only if you haven't done what you're supposed to do. Because if you're obeying and following the leading of God, God has given you enough in the sixth year, the Bible talks about it, to last you all the way through the seventh year and until the harvest of the next year. God will do that. The question is, how much are you going to trust God? How much are you going to believe that God said what he said and meant that? Now, the problem was too many of them had to make the, make the extra bucks. Too many of them, oh, I'm going to get in trouble here. Y'all stand behind me now, kind of like bodyguards, okay, in case I get shot. I've got to have the overtime. I know it's taken away from my family, but 
I know I got to miss church, but hello, you don't have enough confidence that God can take care of your income, and so you're depending on your own abilities and your own self to answer what you think God's not going to answer. I feel the Holy Ghost. I, I feel the Holy Ghost. Listen to me, because this is why. What happened was for 490 years, 490 years, they did not keep the Sabbath of years. And God said, I'll take you out of the land of promises. I'll put you in captivity until I have taken back those 70 years. We're going to look at this. I'm getting ahead of myself, but we're going to look at this later on in the book of Daniel, but we're going to see the significance of those things in, in, in the time when we get into the prophetic things. But this is the reason they got into, into captivity. Bear in mind, God doesn't play games. God will get back his own. He will do it. All right, let's go to the next set of verses. And uh, let's, let's look at those things. Uh, what we're beginning to look at here is Babylon, their system of indoctrination. They're going to take Israel captive, and they're going to begin to indoctrinate Israel. Oh, man, I'd like to get opinionated tonight because every one of you that are still in school are facing constant indoctrination. The news media is full of continual indoctrination. It's just it just amazes me. And uh, of course I don't I don't listen to I don't have a television, don't listen to television news or anything like that. But I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you that this mainstream media that is out there is pushing a message so that it will get into the minds of America and they're indoctrinating this world. What you're going to see in these next few verses is the conscription, the taking out of young, bright minds. Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. King spoke unto Ashvin. Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge, understanding science, and such as had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace. They got poise. They've got, they've got a little culture to them in whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. He said, I want you to get some and I want you to bring them the ones that are going to be the finest and the best minds of Israel. One of the reasons so many, so many preachers don't encourage their kids to go to college is because they know the teachings that are going on in our colleges. Now, I personally do not think that we need to isolate our children from this world. I don't believe in insulation like that. Uh, I don't believe in putting them in some kind of bubble to try to keep them from getting affected by the world because at some place you're going to have to learn to stand up and have faith and convictions on your own. And you won't learn that if you don't get out there and have some pressure. The scripture talks about endure hardness as a good soldier. Anybody know how you could get calluses? You, you don't do it by <laughs> so sweet of things. You're going to have to grip something. You're going to, have to, you're going to have to work. You're going to have to pay for it. You're going to have to go through some physical pain. No pain? No. That's what I thought. It's just something you've got to do. And so they are bringing this, the brightest, the smartest, the, the, the ones that have got the right kind of, of backgrounds and everything else, and, uh, and they have brought them. They've not only confiscated holy things, but they've confiscated the youth, 
the future of Israel. Young men, young women, children of Calvary Apostolic Church, if you only understood how much we depend upon you getting it down inside of your hearts. I want you to love God, not just at youth convention, not just at youth camp. We want you to fall in love right here in your home church. We want you to have that passion from the time you're a young child up because the world knows your values. Ooh, somebody shout for me. I got this mic. Somebody shout. Because I'm telling you the devil knows that you are so important to the future. And if he can destroy you, he can destroy the work. But oh God, put us a Daniel, put us some Hebrew children in there that have got it so deep inside of their soul, they're not going to let it go. Somebody shout amen. amen. So he said, I want you to do that. He, was, he knew what he was doing. He was shrewd. He was a smart tactician. Because he knew if he can undermine the youth of a nation, he could change the entire course of that nation. And then, anybody ever heard of the concept of grooming? They can be groomed for more than one thing. I'd like to groom everybody to be a servant of Jesus Christ. I'd like to groom you to be used of God in a godly and holy way. Because the world would like to groom you for their own nefarious purposes. Uh, people groom young people all the time for, for immoral things. They groom them for all kinds of things. That's what's going on. They're, they're, they're building these relationships. Oh, Lord. I'm just like, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Y'all need to just stand back here and hold me up like Aaron and her. I got to say it. I just got to let it out. Your coach is not your pastor. Your band teacher is not your pastor. You may, you may like them and they may do all of that, but don't you ever get to the place that they become your spiritual authority and your confidant because their agendas is not the word the way that God wants things. I wished it was different. I wished our school systems would teach a godly message and a wholesome message, but that's not what's going on. So they're grooming them for their own purposes and things. Let's go to chapter 1, verse 5 through 7. The king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the princes of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto the name of Daniel Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, he called Shadrach, to Mishael, he called Meshach, and to Azariah, he called Abednego. Now, he did this to take away their identities. I told you last week, the one went into captivity further up north in Assyria, and they assimilated into the culture of the Assyrians, and they were lost to society from then on. But I want you to understand, if you can love God, God in the midst of a place like, like Babylon and you can live for God in a place called Rome where Rome was such an ungodly threatening place to society. You can live for God in Dinuba. You can live for God in all the kind of things that you face. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Praise God. Praise God. So let, let, me, let me show you this. Let me tell you about their Babylonian names. He changed the name to Daniel. Daniel's name means, and we talked about this last week, God is my judge. I don't answer to you. I mean, we do have relationships, and, and I, I do value your opinions, but at the end of time, I'm going to have to stand before God myself. 
And God's going to be the one that judges those things at that time. But he changed it to the name of Belteshazzar, meaning that this man is Bel's, which was an idol god, Bel's prince. In other words, a, 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 a royalty, yes, royalty, but you are now a child of this heathen god. And I can imagine Daniel saying, no, I'm not. I never will forget um, uh, brother, uh, brother Jeff Arnold preaching a message at Because of the Times many years ago. And his message was simply, I am not an Egyptian. And he, he could imagine that, that little Hebrew mother constantly telling little Moses, Moses, I got to let you go back to, to, to that Pharaoh's house and you got to go to Pharaoh's daughter because they're, they've adopted you. But don't you forget, you're an Israelite by birth. You are not an Egyptian. I can imagine Daniel and his three young friends feeling like, I'm living in Babylon, but I am not a Babylonian. I am in this world, but I am not of this world. Somebody shout Amen. So Bell's prince. Number two was that of Hananiah, which means beloved of the Lord. What a confidence that is, that God loves me. And it was changed to Shadrach, which means illuminated by the sun god. There's a lot of people that get illuminated by the sun god. They radiate sunburns. But uh, so because of the worship of the sun and all of that, they changed it to that. They changed the name of Mishael, who means who is God, who is as God, who is as God. No other words, there's nobody as great as our God. Nobody like him. They changed his name to Meshach, which means who is like Shaq, which is another one of their Babylonian, uh, this one a goddess, uh, somewhat akin to a star and Venus. In other words, goddesses of love. And so they're saying that, that uh, sensual love is one of the greatest things that you could have. No, 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 no. Then Azariah, the fourth one, whose name means the Lord is my help. He's, my, he's the one that's going to come to my help, my rescue. They changed his name to Abednego, which meant servant of Nago, whoever Nago was. And they trained him like that. Three years. Three years he was going to feed them. Three years he was going to put his values inside of them. Three years he was going to let them be taken care of by the king. And obviously they would become greatly indebted to the king. But Daniel just couldn't handle that. Can I be honest with you tonight? I'm glad that you let me be honest. I'm glad you don't expect me to lie to you. This knee brace is bothering me and my knee is starting to hurt. And so I think you guys would forgive me if I said I got to let you go. Is that right? Amen. It's, it's, it's starting to fuss at me. Let's stand together, shall we? Praise God. Pray for my healing. Pray that God takes care of this. But in Jesus' name, just oh, I, feel, I feel so good in the Holy Ghost about what we've looked at so far tonight. Pray that God would do something special next, next Wednesday night. God talks to us. God gives us a backbone in the South, would say you need a backbone like a saw log. Stand up against the things of the world. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your great presence. Thank you for your spirit we have felt tonight. I pray for everybody in this house. I pray, God, that you would put deep convictions inside of us. Help us to love you with everything that we have. Help us to be passionate about.